Madoka Magica begins like any Magical Girl anime. Our unassuming lead is brought into a world she had never known existed, and discovers she, too, can become special. Madoka Kaname is perfectly naive, for exactly as long as the series allows her to be. Madoka Magica's realism is blistering, whereas other anime of its ilk typically serve the purpose of inciting optimism, hope, and self-empowerment, here is a story that digs deeper, and observes any one of the more likely outcomes of the Magical Girl setup. When the series' characteristic cynicism was taken to its most extreme conclusion in its follow-up, Rebellion, much of its audience balked. Understandable, considering the film posited a very different conclusion to its predecessor. However, to mistake the depiction of these opposing characters as an endorsement of either would be a misstep. Unmarred by a moralising voice to the last, Madoka Magica does not send its audience away with any adage, only a number of disquieting questions. And this is exactly its strength. Magical girls are typically depicted as supremely selfless beings. In the world of Madoka Magica, they have an incentive. This immediately serves to skew a familiar narrative, introducing a whole different subset of motives beyond a simple want to fight for justice. The character of Mami Tomoe is initially depicted as being much the same as her contemporaries, someone who uses her power for the sake of the greater good, without expectation of reward. And yet we soon see this is a facade. She selfishly brings Madoka and her best friend Sayaka Miki dangerously close to the action, in hopes of putting on a good enough show to sell the gig. All she really wants is friends to fight alongside. In death, she is deified by Madoka and Sayaka, their survivor's guilt over her unintended sacrifice perpetuating the cycle. Enter Homura Akemi. Homura does not want Madoka to become a magical girl for a number of reasons, the only readily apparent one being her firmly held belief that Madoka should not have to sacrifice herself for anyone else's sake. Madoka's eventual wish to do exactly this seems to be the step she needs to take to reach self-confidence and purpose. And yet writer Gen Robuchi has equally said that when she tells Homura she would never truly want to leave her loved ones and be forgotten, this is the truth. So which one is it? Magical girl anime ultimately seek to appeal to a female audience and impart tales and messages young girls can relate to. Madoka Magica is no different, and yet, rather than supporting the Eternal Feminine construct, it challenges it. The Eternal Feminine is a term we see directly linked to Madoka herself. It refers to the belief that women hold an ineffable core essence, an innate purity that translates into any number of the traits Madoka represents. Compassion, innocence, mildness, selflessness. Society's expectations of women have always relied on a self-sacrificial nature. Cross your legs, keep quiet, and smile. Make sure everyone around you is comfortable before thinking about yourself. This series directly acknowledges the pressures acting upon young girls especially, citing them as the source of both the greatest hope and despair found in the universe. Even Kyube almost ridicules the girls, going so far as to pathologize the very emotions its species find so useful. Madoka Magica is absolutely dedicated to validating the often overlooked pain of female adolescence, with each and every witch in the show having a backstory, a name, and a wish of their own that had eventually driven them to despair. Madoka's lack of self-worth eventually evolves into a messiah complex. But rather than this being celebrated, Madoka's peers berate her for lacking self-preservation. She should be grateful she has a normal life. To give in to her sense of responsibility would be a grave mistake. In taking on the role of the magical girl, the characters populating this world gain an easy way out. A quick hit of self-worth. As we eventually see from the outcomes of their wishes, Attempts at true selflessness are far more often a recipe for disaster. The best way to bring happiness into the world is to become the best version of yourself you can be. 
it is also the hardest. Rather than earning love through first loving yourself, how tempting it is to bribe it through a miracle. How easy to take the role you have been handed and with it the promise that you are now a worthwhile person. The magical girls belong to a vicious cycle. Sayaka's arc asks whether humans are fundamentally capable of wishing for someone else's happiness if it does not benefit them in some way. She comes to feel that not only the boy she has healed, but also the world owe her something for her suffering. The bitterness festers, with no antidotes but the realisation that life is not so fair. After all, we all need our pain to be acknowledged by someone. This want for recognition, if not glory, would perhaps elsewhere be framed as a defect. In Madoka Magica, it is only human. <laughs> Madoka Magica's characters are never criticised for holding so strongly to their beliefs, quite the opposite. While Madoka herself is deeply uncomfortable with the conflicts that crop up throughout the series, these are strictly necessary. There's a recurring visual motif of one character offering another an item, only for this gesture to be rejected. This serves to endlessly underline the chasm between what these two individuals each value. Most powerful of all is the instance of this found at the very end of Rebellion, when Homura returns Madoka's ribbon to her, and in doing so seems able, finally, to accept the ways in which they will always be different to one another. One of the most striking elements of Madoka Magica's coming-of-age narrative is the awareness the characters each have to reach, that you won't always see eye to eye with your loved ones, not least of all as pertains to their life decisions and worldview. I know I've found myself arguing with friends in the past because I felt I knew what was best for them. Over time, I have come to learn that the worth of our decisions comes exactly from our willingness to hold to them, no matter how many people tell us they would have acted differently. Likewise, Madoka's mother endeavours to teach her that nobody can affirm her way of living or tell her she is in the right. In their final scene together, and one of the most simultaneously concise and poignant depictions of what growing up is that I've seen, rather than keeping Madoka safe against her wishes, her mother simply asks her if she's sure this is what she wants to do, then sends her off. Free will is a huge overarching theme in this series. Simply put, the only thing that truly matters is, again, what the characters themselves want, not their co-cast, nor the audience. It's not even about what's quote-unquote right. The real challenge these characters face is not that of affirming their own morality, but of making decisions representative of their core selves, against all outside influence. What struggle could be more representative of adolescence than that of answering the pivotal question, who are you? Homura then presents the impossibility of compromise in self-actualization. Her despair in the scene where she transforms into a witch is from her realisation that she cannot accept the world the one she loves wished for. Madoka's world is built on her selflessness, a trait Homura rejects ferociously. Everyone has their opinion on whether Homura did anything wrong, but what does she think? The entirety of Rebellion is a very thinly veiled exploration of Homura's trauma and resulting self-hatred. Certainly, her endless time looping would have done more than a little damage to her psyche, but if anything, it numbed her response to violence. Save for one incident. As demonstrated masterfully by Chiwa Saito's acting, the moment wherein Homura first has to kill Madoka before she becomes a witch tortures her. After bearing witness to Madoka's many sacrifices, she feels a duty to likewise suffer. In Madoka's case, this is as a form of twisted repayment to the magical girls who have come before her. 
in Homeras, its pure reenactment of trauma. Victims of one traumatic incident are, simply put, far more likely to be victims of another. The speculated reasons for this are many, but in Homura's case, her lack of regard for her own well-being seems to be an extreme form of self-neglect, born of subconscious self-blame. It doesn't help that it was exactly her looping which enabled Madoka to build up such immense karmic power, thus seemingly locking her into what Homura sees as no less of a dead-end fate than the death she had been trying to prevent. No matter what, it seems, she is responsible for Madoka's pain, and is thus undeserving of salvation. This scene with Sayaka is particularly striking, as she was the most evidently self-hating character in the series. Madoka Magica focuses in on the corporeal reality of the magical girls, the bodily trauma they bear witness to and experience. As a result, they detach themselves from the physicality of their experiences. This evolves for Sayaka into another means of self-harm. It is no coincidence that this all comes after the reveal that magical girls' souls are separated permanently from their bodies. Sayaka's reaction to this information is strikingly similar to one that might be found in a victim of sexual trauma and violation. She begins to exhibit intense depersonalization, a complete disconnect from her physical reality and the body she finds herself in, one that she now sees as somehow broken. <laughs> this is very much a work that looks at what it means to be the owner of a transformed body. Lest we forget, magical girls are equally pubescent teenagers. This culminates in the eldritch abominations that the girls eventually become, almost a testament to how they see themselves. The knowledge that their souls are held within a physical object, sealed away by a contract, is painfully evocative of the realisation every woman faces that in a patriarchal society their bodies will never truly belong to only themselves. And yet, in Rebellion, we see something even more striking than a Sayaka who has never had to face these struggles. Rather, she works side by side with her witch form in fights, as if embracing the self she had once hated so much. Hope and despair are, after all, two sides of the same coin. Few works illustrate this point so comprehensibly. Hope eventually devolves into despair as we learn we are not always rewarded for our sacrifices in life. Madoka Magica begs the questions. Is hope futile? Is it worth the pain it can so often bring? Is it better to gracefully accept our circumstances and try to thrive within their confines? Again, it refuses us the answers, imploring us to come up with our own. Still, it makes compelling cases for both sides of the argument. Madoka's wish at the end of the series is ultimately a compromise one that works in synchronicity with the Incubator's system and pleases everyone. Almost everyone. Comparatively, Rebellion is about exactly that. Homura seeks to destroy the system entirely. As Milton said, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Homulili is described as the Witch of Shigan, the Witch of the Mortal World. Comparatively, Madoka represents heaven, salvation from suffering. In Rebellion, Homura promptly sets about destroying the fake world she finds herself in. Time and again, Madoka Magica asks us whether there is meaning to the fabricated. Miracles that were never meant to be, bought love, achievements born not of our own hard work, the person we pretend to be. At the height of their despair, the witches submit themselves wholly to an illusory world. 
Some have even argued Rebellion's opening act is a meta-commentary, ridiculing the audience for their tendency towards fanfiction, wherein all the characters are fine and half of the events of the series never happened. What is reality, and does it even matter? The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell. A hell of heaven. If you felt the world Homura had constructed at the end of the film felt disconcertingly false in spite of it all, you aren't alone. From the eerily halved moon to the Claridols willingly sending themselves into the abyss, it is as though Homura has accepted this world is the only place where she can truly be happy, in all its deceit. And in the single chair she finds herself on, we are reminded that she has severed any genuine connection she held with Madoka for good. Whether Homura's actions were, in a sense, actually selfless is worth debating. She shields Madoka once and for all from the Incubator's machinations, and protects her wish in the process. But all she really wants is to have Madoka for herself. Her thought process is, by this point, painfully evident. That of an abusive partner. Let me ask you a question. Think back to your first relationship. How old were you? The lower the number, the less healthy that relationship probably was. And it's only natural. It can be destructive to engage in an intimate relationship before you have developed a stable one with yourself. But Madoka Magica does not only send us away with this message, we are equally shown Sayaka and Kyoko Sakura, who experience an inverse trajectory. While beginning on rocky ground, the two are eventually able to learn from, understand, and finally accept each other as distinct individuals, the absolute blueprint for a healthy relationship. Homura's real wish was simply to be with Madoka. As this drifts ever further out of reach, she goes to ever greater lengths to make it a reality. What follows is denial, and an absolute unwillingness to move on, as is the darker side of the time loop trope. Homura is dependent on Madoka from the beginning. This makes sense when we see how lacking in confidence and companionship she is when she first transfers into Mitakihara. Moreover, they then go on to develop a genuine relationship, culminating in Madoka's pivotal words. <laughs> Forget anime characters, could the average person really cope with not being able to see the most important person to them ever again? Grief breaks people, and some never fully recover. Homura is just one such instance of this, lest we forget she is incredibly young. Her behaviour in Rebellion is plainly manipulative. She even goes so far as to have Madoka transfer to the US, likely weakening her relationship with childhood friend Sayaka. She isolates her in order to know she will have a monopoly on Madoka's reality, and make her likewise dependent. This unflinching portrayal of how possessive teenage love can be naturally made people uncomfortable, but we do see the other end of the spectrum in Sayaka and Kyoko. Urobuchi was not out to demonise lesbians, he was out to portray love more honestly than most media would dare to. Its ability to both heal and corrupt, and how scarily easy it is for one to replace the other. Madoka Magica covertly addresses its audience as such. Often Kyubei points out how little they understand the character's actions. But who says they are owed this? Homura is a striking character because she pursues what she wants and doesn't seek redemption in the eyes of the viewer. The aim in this series was never to create characters we would absolutely sympathise with, or could judge as being plainly right or wrong. 
So rarely can we do this in real life. In portraying the many shades morality comes in through a fictional work and a world with an ever-changing viewpoint, we see that characters can hand around the role of the antagonist depending on this gaze. Likewise, if we can find it in ourselves, I think we can understand at least a little of each character's struggles and their attempts to surmount them, whether successful or not. <laughs> Some felt Rebellion ruined a perfectly good series. In fact, it only reinforces the very same core theme. Madoka and Homura equally demonstrate the power you can harness should you choose to pursue your own goals wholeheartedly. Madoka Magica won't tell you who to agree with, only that in acting with such conviction, our leads are taking back a little of the power their world has robbed them of. Throughout the endless cycle of hope and despair, selflessness and selfishness, reality and dream, trauma and healing, childhood and maturation, peace and rebellion. <laughs>